So the example I want to do next here, the last name and Pearson related example I want to do is kind of weird, very different than what you've ever done before, but maybe kind of interesting because of that. The null and the alternative hypotheses are going to be unlike what we've ever done before. Instead of testing parameter value, we're testing whether a random variable has one PDF versus a, di a different PDF. Or in this case, actually, one PMF, probability mass function, versus a different one, because it's going to be a discrete random variable. Is the PMF of the random variable X equal to the PMF of a Poisson with a mean of one. So this is going to be e to the negative one times one to the x over x factorial, which since one to the x is one, simplifies to just e to the negative one over x factorial. When x is zero, one, two, three, et cetera, and zero otherwise, or the alternative hypothesis is that the PDF is going to be something else, PMF, I should say. Essentially, the PMF of what you might call a shifted geometric random variable. And when it's non-zero, it's going to be one half to the x plus one power for x equals zero, one, two, three, et cetera. I wanted to make it a shifted geometric random variable by effectively making this power x plus one instead of x, since I want the domain where this is non-zero to match the domain where this is non-zero starting at x equals zero instead of x equals one. Zero otherwise. All right, we've never seen a hypothesis test like this before. Okay, and I rarely think about such things. I, I was reading in this book again and found it as, a, as an example and saw that I had highlighted it. So I had studied it before. Uh, so it's evidently something I've looked at before, but I didn't remember it. Okay, so we want to think about doing this hypothesis test. How? Well, for a given alpha, the goal would be to try to find a critical region. Or maybe we decide on a critical region and figure out alpha. In fact, we're going to do the second thing because that's easier. We're going to decide on a critical region and find alpha, the probability of a type 1 error, the level of significance of the test. What would the critical region be here? These, the possible values of x are discrete, 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. But this is clearly, it's hard to say whether this is a right-tailed test or a left-tailed test or something else. I don't know what to call it, right? It's unlike anything we've ever done before. How do you decide what values of X would lead to rejecting this null hypothesis in favor of the alternative? And if you did reject the null incorrectly, what's the probability of making a type one error? Thinking about the name in Pearson lemma is helpful. Because it turns out the proof of the Neyman theorem Pearson lemma actually allows us to generalize it. Now, we didn't look at the proof, but that's what these authors said. If you study the proof of it in depth enough, you realize you can generalize the proof to a more general setting, including this kind of setting. And the likelihood ratio still defines the best critical region, which maybe this would be a multiple choice question for the, for the exam. What does it mean to be a best critical region? It means it's the most powerful critical region for a given alpha, it's going to maximize the power, minimize the probability of a type two error. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the likelihood ratio. I think I will not use the L notation because there's really not in a sense one likelihood function because there are two different PMFs. But I will write the ratio, that's the product of the 
likelihood functions for each of these things individually. The numerator for the null hypothesis, the denominator for the alternative hypothesis. So we, in the numerator, we do have the product of these kinds of expressions, e to the negative one over x sub i factorial. And in the denominator, we have the product of these kinds of expressions, one half to the x sub i plus one. So this would still be the likelihood ratio. And we could still say this being less than or equal to some number would be what we would use to define a best critical region. That makes the test most powerful, maximizes the power. It's going to be less than or equal to K. What is K? It depends on what alpha is. K and alpha are related. But that kind of inequality is what defines the best critical region, according to the Neyman Pearson lemma in a more general form. Of course, you usually want to simplify this. E to the negative one is getting multiplied by itself n times. So that's the same as e to the negative n. In the bottom, we really have like an x1 factorial times an x2 factorial times an x3 factorial. That doesn't convert to a sum. It would still be a product. I could put the product in the bottom of the fraction though. Is this a good idea or not? I guess it's not clear. Of course, this is the same as one half to the first power times one half to the xi. <clears throat> you could bring the one half to the first power out in front as one half to the nth power because you'd be multiplying it by itself n times. And that's the same as two to the negative n. Might be a nicer way to write that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the other one halves, you could add their exponents. You could do this kind of thing. Convert the product to a sum of the exponents. Can we continue simplifying? Sure. You got e to the negative n over two to the negative n. That could be written as e over two to the negative n want or even two over e to the positive n and actually because this is a one half to the summation power you could bring it into the numerator as a two to the summation power does that make sense because one half is two to the negative one. It's in the bottom, it could go into the top as a two. And then the product of the XI, oh, I, for, I made a mistake, XI factorials. I forgot my factorial there. Goes down there. Okay, it's a little better looking, I guess. <clears throat> so best critical region, is defined by that kind of inequality. And in theory, you could imagine it to be <clears throat> a set of points in n-dimensional space satisfying this inequality. But of course, that's a very complicated looking inequality still. It's hard to imagine what that set would look like, so to speak, even if n were one or, well, even if n were two or three. I mean, you could try to use Mathematica to graph it perhaps, for different values of k and n, and maybe maybe I'll do that on Monday. We'll see if we can get Mathematica to graph it when n is two or three, just to see what it looks like, what the best critical region looks like as a subset of two or three dimensional space. I mean, more often we try to write this in terms of summations so we can use statistics to decide to reject or not. And this could be thought of as a statistic, but it's it's a very complicated statistic. I could take logarithms. That would certainly be one way to try to um, rewrite this in a way that, that might be a lot simpler. 
Um, I think I'm not going to bother. Instead, let's see how this simplifies if we plug in special value of n and k. Plug in n equals one, sample of size one, and k equals one, just to keep things simple. What does it look like? What does the inequality become? If you do that, it, it becomes a lot simpler, actually. You get two over e to the first power times two to the, if n is one, you really just have an x one up top and an x one factorial on the bottom. And if little k is one, then I put have a one there. And this could be rewritten as two to the x one over x one factorial is less than or equal to e over two. And what is e over two? It's about 1.359. So in that case, when I've got a sample of size one, would you ever want to do samples of size one? Uh, that would be rare. Maybe if it's unavoidable, you could. If you had to just do a sample of size one to make a decision here, probably not a good idea unless you just can't avoid it. But this would lead to a decision rule. It's possible the alpha could be large, though, that the probability of type one error could be large. And in fact, that will happen. It's going to be kind of large. But we'll figure it out anyway. I pick k to be one. Rarely would k be one. You'd usually want little k to be something less than one. But just to illust just for the purposes of illustration is all this is. So the critical region would be defined by this inequality. And the question is now is what is alpha? What's the probability of type one error? So that's the probability of rejecting the null when the null is true. In other words, it's the probability for this n equals one and this k equals one that, yeah, you could say the random variable two, o, two to the x over x factorial. Notice I'm not putting a subscript of one there because it's just one observation, so I don't need to is less than or equal to 1.359 given that the null is true meaning remember what the null is it's a hypothesis about the form of the pmf i'll say given that x is poisson because that is a poisson with a mean of one. The null hypothesis formula was the PMF for a Poisson with a mean equal to one. Remember Poisson and geometric random variables both count things. Geometric random variables as we usually think about them count the number of trials till the first success. Actually, this shifted geometric random variable, which includes a value x equals zero, would count the number of failures until the first success. And if your success is on the first trial, that means your number of failures was zero. There's really two ways to think about geometric random variables, either the number of trials until the first success or the number of failures until the first success. If you count the number of trials and trials and trials until the first success, x can't be zero. The minimum value of x is one. 
But if you count the number of failures until the first success, if your first success is on the first trial, then you had zero failures. That's Poisson. Poisson counts the number of occurrences of an event, sometimes, oftentimes in a given time interval, for example. During the next hour, how many cars will go through the, in through the intersection? How many people will show up in the store in the next hour or the next day? Those are examples of Poisson random variable applications. How are we going to figure this out? I guess we'd have to figure out what values of x would lead to this inequality being true. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. We, which, which of those lead to this kind of inequality being true? X factorial does grow faster than two to the x does. So when x is large enough, this inequality should be true. So it's going to initially seem like it could be a right tailed test. But is it? Today's class 17. Uh, let's make a table of values, say x comma two to the x over x factorial. We'll do approximations there. As x goes starting at zero and goes up to say 10. Yeah, when X is large enough, we get pretty small numbers. Certainly the inequality is satisfied, but the inequality is actually also satisfied when X is zero. It's only not satisfied when X is one or two. So, this probability is the same as the probability of X equaling zero, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, given X is Poisson with mean of one. Not one or two. Simplest way to compute that probably would be use, use the complement rule. Like that. Oh, and for variety, let's use the calculator. Go to your distributions menu. Poisson PDF, lambda is the mean. When X is one, what's the probability of the PDF? It's 0.368 approximately. And when X is two, About 0.184. So we get 0.448. If we use this as a rejection region, right here, the critical region, we call it C. C as a set here, the critical region. Would be the set containing zero, three, four, five, six, et cetera, not, not one or two. That will be a best critical region for this value of alpha. 
Now, it's hard, because of the discrete nature of this random variable, it's hard to imagine that there's some other critical region corresponding to this exact value of alpha or even this approximate value of alpha. But this will be a best one. It will maximize the power. Now, again, that's, that's a large value of alpha. You'd never want to use that. So that's just the purposes of illustration. And this value of alpha does correspond to the little k here equaling one in this case. More typically, little k would be smaller. And that would lead to an alpha that's smaller. But I wanted to use the k equals little k equals one because it resulted in a strange looking critical region, just to illustrate that strange looking critical regions can happen. That was the point, actually. Unexpected. That's an unexpected result. If K gets smaller and alpha gets smaller, then the critical region becomes more ordinary looking. If, if we had well, a smaller number here, like half of that, 0.6 something, say, then your critical region is all X values bigger than or equal to something, a more ordinary looking critical region. So the point here is just educational, instructive, that it is possible for weird looking critical regions to happen. What's the power of this test? And as always, what's the probability of a type two error? They're related. You know, the power is one minus beta, where beta is the probability of a type two error. Let's just compute it as the power. What's the power of the test? that would be maximized for this given alpha for this test. It would be the probability that uh, you are in the critical region given that the alternative is true. X is 0, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Given that H1 is true, H1 is true, which means X, the random variable, has a quote unquote shifted geometric ge distribution. This is my name, by the way, shifted geometric. I don't know that that's the official name. It's PMF is that thing. So that's the thing we have to use com to compute probabilities for the power. And once again, we should use the complement rule. And let's once again have Mathematica do it for us. Well, I guess we did it with calculator before, didn't we? Oh, that's, that's, this is easy enough to do with calculator, and we don't even need to use the distribution menu. PMF is one half raised to the X plus one power. When X is one, that's one half squared, one fourth. When X is two, that's one half to the third power, one eighth. Oh, running out of room, one eighth. One fourth plus one eighth, what is that? Three eighths. One minus three eighths is five eighths. The power is five eighths. Point six two five. And for this, for this alpha of 0. 0.448, that's the biggest the power can be. That's what the name and Pearson lemma guarantees. Yeah. Okay. So it's no pun intended, or maybe I should say pun intended. This is a pretty powerful thing, really. It's very flexible. It's, it applies to lots of situations, including weird situations. Maybe that's something to remember for on the job for the future is, hey, I remember Naaman Pearson applied to weird situations. Maybe I should try that because I don't know what else, what else to do with this situation that I'm trying to make a decision about some model. 
Poisson distributions, by the way, are used all the way all the time, for example, in insurance. Counting the number of earthquakes in the next five years, for example, or whatever, the number of fires in this town in the next five years. Simplest thing to do is model it as, as a Poisson, but maybe somebody's trying to argue that something like this is more appropriate. So it could happen on the job. But in general, you'd want a sample size bigger than one, so you'd need to deal with a more complicated thing. So you, you could deal with this on a more um, a less abstract level. You could just might say focus on it more computationally, seeing when that kind of inequality holds for a given alpha. Um, 